I was I was about to do that, but I'm not seeing video. I mean, uh, the audio, the video yet. Uh, they had a, uh, a change in their contract. We're, we're planning on meeting next month. Clearly, we thought about we thought about um, Space Center Houston. Also. Well, you guys can talk to them about. It. They got a nice room that we could meet in, and it'd be easy to get in and out of there, you know, without a lot of trouble. Because you know, sometimes they want you to pay for parking. They have to somehow know that we're okay to come in. That's that's a good possibility. That would actually make sense for us to meet there, because they actually have you know they have programs that would benefit from us meeting there. Yeah. A minute and a half, we'll start. Okay, so guys, we got a super full schedule, so we're going to go ahead and get started. Trevor's kind of running around trying to get the stream working. Is anybody hearing me? We're going to get started. Come on, we're going to get started. All righty. Welcome to the August meeting of the Johnson, Johnson Space Center Astronomical Society. I was dreading coming tonight, and here I am. Okay, so uh, welcome to our meeting. This is going to be our last meeting at the Lunar and Planetary Institute. Yeah, I know. Uh, we we really appreciate the partnership we've had with the LPI, but uh, things are changing. So next month, we're hoping we're going to meet over at UH Clear Lake. That is the plan. All right. I know I don't like it either, but what can I do about it? 
here's our agenda for this evening. Um, if you're online, I, I think Trevor's working on getting the online working. It's good. Okay. You can leave comments in the YouTube comments area, or you can send comments to the JSCAS live at gmail.com. And if you're in the audience and you want to have a, you want to say something, be sure they get a microphone to you because uh, we want the people people online to be able to hear your jewels of wisdom of things you have to say to us tonight. So before we get started, we'd like to know if there's anyone here that this is their first time coming to one of our meetings, and so we want to know what your name is, how you heard about the JSCAS, and what your interest is in astronomy. Got any first timers? There's one up there. Oh, hold on. Got to wait till the mic gets to you. See, Trevor's doing everything. He's running the stream and bringing the mics. He's doing it all. Uh, my name is Dev Saha. Um, I heard about this from uh, UHCL's um, Astronomy and Physics Club. So uh, I'm an incoming graduate student uh, in biology. I'm interested in astrobiology in particular. Um, so I wanted to uh, to attend this meeting. Excellent. You know Aaron? Do you know Aaron? He's right oh, in no. front of you. He's the president of your club. Okay, there's one more right over there. Hello, my name is uh, Aramias Hadlesalasi, and uh, I'm a friend of Angie's and Chris, and uh, I'm very much looking forward to this evening. Great, thank you very much for coming. Who else first time here? Okay, I see one here, one there. Hi everyone, uh, my name is John George. I work for Axiom Space, and uh, I have a, an old LX10 uh, Mead telescope that I'm trying to refurbish for the big eclipse coming up. So I thought I'd come in and say hi to everyone. <laughs> Excellent. Yeah. Um, I saw your email about that. One good, one suggestion would be to bring that with you to Mod Pizza. Yeah. Cause there's a lot of sitting around talking at Mod Pizza during the meetings. We just have meetings and we've got uh, Hattie right here. Hi everyone. Uh, my name is Hattie and I'm, um, I'm a uh, astrophysics student at uh, Embryo Antica University, and I'm a NASA Eclipse Ambassador. And I came here because of my um, partner Daniel over here. Nice to meet y'all. Thank you very much. Okay, I see one up there. Given never fails to uh, embarrass the sun. My name is Morgan Hale. I've been coming here for years, but you haven't seen me in a while because of my job. This is my son, Jack Hale. It's his first time. So he's old enough now to appreciate it. He's a lot smarter than me. So I'm going to try to cultivate that and hopefully get him a job outside of the plants where I work. So Okay. So I want to hear your name one more time. Morgan Hale. Morgan Hale and Jack? Jack Hale. Jack Hale. Morgan Hale, Jack Hale. Okay. So we'll all try to act normal so they'll come back again. Uh, <laughs> Okay, nice to have you guys. Anybody else first time here? Is it willing to admit it's your first time here? Okay, I don't see any more hands. All right, good. Thank you. All right, so you saw our agenda. Um, okay, if you want to get on our email distribution, we have two. One's for means only, one's for everything. The top one is for means only. The bottom email address is for general communications. We normally have a clipboard, which is missing, apparently. Um, I can't find it. That has these tear-off things. So I don't have that this time, but uh, if you want to get on our email distribution, that's how you do it. If you go out the door, the doors are definitely locked tonight. So you got to push the button and the doors to let the door unlock. Doors cannot be open for more than 20 seconds or else the alarm will go off and we'll all be miserable because it's really loud. Reminder to all my presenters tonight, uh, microphones so people online can hear you. Leave this one pointed over here because it, it's a long story. Anyway, and then use the mouse pointer so the people online can see. Don't use a different pointer. And let the, if we have questions, let the people in the audience get microphones so that we can hear those questions. All right, so first up, we have our main speaker, Dr. David Haviland. If you've been around here for a while, you know David. And uh, he's going to tell us about my journey in taking lunar images. So first, I'm going to tell you a little bit about David. David's motto is, cells by day, stars by night. David has spent nearly 40 years in the biomedical research field in basic sciences, specifically immunology and auto in, autoimmunity, why your body attacks itself. I forgot my glasses, so hold on. Okay, he got his PhD from the University of California at Riverside, then went to Washington University in St. Louis, 
then to the University of Texas Health Science Center here in Houston for 15 years and has worked for the last 10 years at the Methodist Research Institute. He currently assists researchers in their investigations of cancer, stem cells, biomarker, and immune, immune, immunological studies. He's published articles, book chapters, been a reviewer of a number of scientific journals, and has participated and helped organize, organize international workshops. He has, his PhD has nothing here, he's nothing to do with astronomy. He got started in astronomy in 1998 and has always had an interest in spaceflight and the moon. He has been a member of JSCAS since 1999. In the early 2000s, he met Connie, who also had an, has an interest in astronomy, and they eloped to Hawaii in 2004. They have helped organize and run the Houston Astronomy Day, held positions in both JSCAS and Fort Bend Astronomy Club, co-led an eclipse tour with Paul Maley, and helped Paul with the 2018 Pluto occultation of a 12.9 magnitude star, and both have obtained their outreach, stellar and master outreach awards offered by the Astronomical League. His astronomical interests are broad, but galaxies and nebula are high on this list, only behind observing and photographing the moon. With that, help me join, uh, welcome David up here for his presentation. All right, I'll try to fly through these. This is kind of bittersweet because I first walked through that door in 1999, June of 1999 for my first JSCS, JSCS meeting. And here we are in the Lunar Planetary Institute and I'm talking about the moon. So it's good, but also again, but kind of bittersweet. Sorry to, sorry to see this place go. All right, um, my travel so far in lunar photography, this has really meant more inspirationally to get people to consider doing some form of astrophotography. I'm not gonna just jump in and show you, ooh, what a pretty picture. I'm gonna show you how I got to that point of getting pretty pictures. I will probably, I will definitely show you some of my oopses, bad assumptions, and some of my errors along the way uh, as far as, as far when it came to generating pictures. So Doug had some of my, uh, um, uh, introduction stuff here. You are more than welcome to take any pictures through this. Uh, I've got a number of things on Astrobin that I will show you. You're welcome to any of those pictures that are on my Astrobin page, as long as you please keep the copyright intact. Um, yeah, this was from the 2017, 2017 eclipse, and this is the rig that I used at that time. I'm gonna change the rig for uh, the annular and the total. All right, here's the Astrobin. I've got a number of images that I have loaded up. You're free to go look at it you want to. A lot of people have some really good stuff up there, so I highly recommend that. So what got me started in astrophotography or the, well, was actually the moon. It can be observed in urban skies, and anybody that does outreach knows that the moon is a public, um, uh, public crowd pleaser. Like many in the clubs, I was one of those kids glued to a TV in July 20th, 1969. In my case, it was a 15-inch black and white TV, and I was the remote. Um, Fast forward about 1998, and we, had a, we got a Celestron Starhopper as a gift, and I was looking at the moon before I even looked at my first, uh, first DSL. Tools that help, I'll talk a little bit about that. Moon Connection is a computer-based one. It's what I put the, uh, the, the cycle, the layout of the moon on the web page. I'll have a few shots of it here. Lunafact is my favorite phone app for it. I've got these others down here, as well as uh, Google Moon blends LRO pictures with uh, uh, ground-based tele telescope pictures of the moon. When you dial in real close, it'll start pulling in LRO shots, particularly of the, the Apollo landing sites. So here is um, moon connection, and this is actually for this month. We are sitting right here on the 11th, and what we have here is a, a waning moon. The moon is going away from us as we get near 16th, which is gonna be our new moon. Then it starts creeping back into what we see is a waxing moon. The point here is, this is coming in the early evening and then up to about midnight or so until you get down to about 30 or 31 here. Then once you come back here, it starts rising later and later. So the point is, if you wanna start chasing the Terminator and start taking pictures of the moon while it's waning, as I have done, you better get up at three and four o'clock in the morning. 
LunaFact, as I said, is one of my favorite, favorite apps. You can dial in the particular date that you want. It gives the moon rise, transits when it's above and when it sets. It also lets you know when sunset and twilight are. I'm not also let you know the percent uh, of how much it is lit. I'm not going to belabor all of the little details here. You can uh, check that and you can check that out as you explore the uh, uh, app. What I want to do is compare these consecutive days, yesterday, today, and tomorrow. And what you see, rise 134, 220, rises 310, transits 851, 944, 1036. Each day, there's about a 40, 40 to 55 minute offset each time. You have to plan for that if you're going to observe the moon. And it's part of the reason those of us involved with outreach try to see if we can keep the moon in play during outreach. Because, it, uh, as I said, the moon can often it can be a, a great crowd pleaser. But we actually like to chase the Terminator because of the detail that you can see here. This is a picture uh, kindly provided from our president, Doug Holland. And as you can see here, as the, moon, as the sun is coming in incident from the right-hand side, the moon is largely washed out over here. There's not a lot of detail. You have to work to pull detail out of it. And a work, I mean work in, in Photoshop. Over here, the detail comes a little bit better because the light is a little more incident. It's not direct. It's not blowing out what you're looking at. You can actually uh, make out some geographical features. Uh, Ptolemus is sitting here. The Hadley Apennine Mountain Ridge is up there. So what we really do is we chase the Terminator. So it kind of makes it problematic, particularly in Houston, what, Houston uh, Texas weather with the clouds and the humidity. And the humidity makes the skies extremely soft and rough rough to, to work with. But here we're chasing the Terminator. So in an ideal world, what would make me very happy is about 60 degrees, 20% humidity, and absolutely crystal clear cloudless sky for an entire month. Then I could chase the Terminator to my heart's content. But no, usually this has to be a staggered month progression. If my best shot for, say, Hadley Apennine is going to be on the 25th or 24th, and those two days are clouded, Guess what? I'm either having to chase it back here the following cycle or I got to wait a month to do it. So it takes time to generate the generate images and get an inventory of images depending on seeing and where the cycle is on the moon. Now, as a minor digression, uh, we do have, I think we've got a, a, a night sky lunar, uh, lunar kit where you have size appropriate Earth and the moon. And if you put them on each other, you put it out here, this is something that Aaron Clear Clevison used to do with us at A-Day. If you put the Earth on one, where do you put the moon? And it turns out when you convert 30 inches into 240,000 miles, the moon goes out to inch 31. But people seem to think the moon is just hanging there. It's just, you know, a softball shot away. No, it isn't. It's quite a ways away, 240,000 miles worth. So... All the crazy math aside, and the, what that is, is I eliminated a slide here where I discussed the Dawes limit, and I really kind of don't want to go in there, go in on that. I will stop to say the Dawes limit was a theoretical, mathematical uh, uh, approximation of what you should be able to see with a telescope, but that idealized uh, math does not take into account the um, uh, atmosphere, telescope optics, and things like that. Um, on average, you should be able to see two to three miles on the lunar surface, three to four miles easy in most scopes, up to about six to eight inches. If you want to see things up around one to half, one to one and a half miles, or even less, you're going to need a scope that's going to be at least eight inches or more. Some of the better shots will be down to just under a mile resolution. So then you start developing your own litmus tests for seeing and whether or not you want to try to try to photograph. And then some of these observations I will show you, St. George's Crater, 7,900 feet across, splitting center spur peaks and some of the craters, such as Clavius, Theophilus, as well as some of the volcanic rills. I will show you those as we proceed. Craters, Colin and Armstrong, are sitting at about two miles across. If you can't see them, then the seeing's probably not good. You may not have a big enough scope, but most often it's going to be the seeing is the reason you won't. You won't do it. You won't be able to see it. As we know, we went to the moon six times, 12 men walked on it. Sadly, only four are with us today, but how many times have we been asked, can I see the flag on the moon? More times than we wanna know. There's a clear lack of understanding that we went more than once. We even saw this during the 50th year celebration. Everything was big hoopla about Apollo 11. Well, you heard a little bit about Apollo 12, but how many heard anything about 13 all the way out to 17? Not much. Always remember that most of the general public Public hasn't viewed this, viewed, viewed the moon moon through a telescope. 
So if you have to think, have the discussion about camera resolution, if the best Earth telescope will get you to about three or seven tenths of a mile, there's no way you're going to see a 30 foot limb or a three foot flag. For the record, I will show them when you get to the photographs, 11, 15, and 17 are pretty easy to find. 16 is easy once you see it. 12 and 14 take some work. The reason is they're out in the middle of nowhere. Lunar photography versus astrophotography versus EAA, something we've had, something has cropped up a bit. They're not the same thing. They're different. They're kind of like apples and oranges. Lunar photography can be done in light polluted skies. It requires much shorter, shorter exposures in the range of milliseconds, not, not minutes. I've got limited experience, but I'm by no means an expert. So I consider this, still consider this talk a work in progress. Astrophotography, like what Chris and uh, Doug do, among others in the club, as well as Trevor, long duration with multiple short, with multiple exposures and five, one to five minute subs and, and can lead you to hours of processing. EAA or electronic assisted astronomy involves doing multiple short exposures with or without guiding, usually anywhere from eight to about 15 seconds, processed in sharp cap. And with some decent effort, you can get images produced. I grabbed, grabbed this one. I think Trevor and I both grabbed a separate uh, M57s off the West Dome at the George. Lunar imaging is a little different because your exposures are extremely short because the moon is, is, is quite bright, but you still need to have some to work it. Still need to work it to get up a, get a, a good image. However, there are commonalities between all the approaches. A clean collimated scope, focus and focusing on the computer screen is not like focusing on the eyepiece. Focusing in the eyepiece, your eye has a lot more, is a lot more quick on the resolution than the computer screen. Alignment to a degree, you can have some drift. We'll talk about that. You should plan on what to observe and when to shoot. If you don't have a camera, you can start with a cell phone. I have a number of people that show up and will snap a picture in the in the scope during an outreach event. Or you can use one of these little gadgets and try to try to try to uh, make those work. My very first image was actually on first attempt was uh, at a, using an Orion planetary camera, auto guiding uh, auto guiding camera with a wind dated 32 laptop that was literally on the on the tailgate of my truck. The dob was in the middle of the garage, middle of the driveway, and I just waited for the moon to come across, and then said, "Okay, start recording." It was totally untracked. I had Registax at the time. I took about sixty percent of the sixty percent of the frames and tweaked it a little, little bit in Registax, and thought, eh, "This isn't bad. That's Clavius. That's Tycho. This is going to be pretty easy." Little did I know, this was completely one hundred and ten percent USDA prime choice dumb luck. Because while I uh, I got something decent worth showing. I had countless, countless failures after that. I was beginning to doubt my efforts, the camera, the whole process. Focusing issues, exposure issues. I made the dumb assumption that like a DSLR, the camera and the computer were and the software were talking to each other. Nope. Little did I know. That's why I said that that figure, that initial figure was completely, completely dumb luck. Uh, I was also at the time researching cameras. This was the camera that I'd used at that time. I decided to pick up this, this little gem. A lot of people use this for auto guiding and for other purposes. I will talk about that later. Other, there are other lunar images that also use this camera. Got a nice small, nice small resolution. So I realized with some little introspection, I had three things going on. I needed to know the scope, the alignment, collimation. I needed to know the camera. I needed to know the acquisition software, fire capture, sharp cap, practice a little bit in the daylight, figuring out the focus knowing my stacking software, and I know I had to know my final processing in Photoshop uh, Creative Cloud. I realized I was fighting a war on five fronts and actually had deficits in all five areas. So I had to kind of work my way through it. Somebody asked me, well, Dave, what does your histogram look like? And I said, what histogram? And then it turns out, ah, it's not the camera's fault. I'd, a chat with Robert Rees in San Antonio, he turned me on to using fire capture. What I've been using here was the PhD planetary. Well, PhD planetary is made by the same people who make PhD guiding. And the PhD guiding software is really kind of slick. The PhD planetary is a little lackluster to say the least. Does it have a histogram? Yes, it's not hidden, but it's not obvious where it was. And as I said, I was assuming the software and the camera were talking to each other, when in fact they were not. So I flipped over completely to, to fire capture. This is where one place where fire capture is superior to sharp cap because you have much finer control over the exposure gain, uh, not only USB, but this could also be gamma, uh, gamma settings. You have much finer 
uh, um, control. You do a single click, it's going to change the hundredth uh, rather than working it off of a slider. So you can then adjust the histogram so you're not oversaturating and undersatur or undersaturating. I also appreciate fire capture because I can change my region of interest. I just click here, click there, and then it asks me, do you want to use that box as your region of interest? And that's really cool when you're trying to hone in on a simple, on a, on a simple area. Go simple. Why not just put the camera on a different scope? Um, a while ago, I think it was December 21, Don Selly of HIS asked a bunch of us to be on the uh, Zoom for the, um, for the novice meeting on getting started in astrophotography. And the preamble, or say, I should say the pre-meeting of that, the, the, everybody got together on Zoom and make sure it's all going to work. And they said, what was the one piece of advice you would actually give to somebody starting out? Start simple. And we all just started laughing. I said, yeah, we wish we started simple. Did any of us start simple? No, we were starting with the full rig, the whole nine yards. I was going all, all, all in with the SCT. And Connie just happened to look and said, you sure seem to be fighting with the SCTs because I was in the backyard playing with the collimation, doing all of this. And said, why don't you just try that wide tube 80? And I'm going, why didn't I think of that? This is Bob Hammond's uh, alt, uh, um, Ioptron AZ Pro mount that he loaned me for a couple of months during the pandemic. So I'm, what I am have here is this picture is actually staged for this talk. This is a wide tube 80. I'm not using a Barlow, but I'm using it as a tube extension. I have removed the element to give me the back focus I need, and I put the, put the camera, camera into the back. The third thing that helped was I got some good data from Jeff Lepp, who, take, who took this with his DAB. This is a WMV, a simple movie file, and I used it as practice to practice my stacking and practice my processing through Photoshop. I also had to make an effort to learn Photoshop. So I like to think that I addressed the camera, software, and processing to, an, to a degree. And this is clearly Mare Ibrium, largest impact basin on the moon, a lot of nice nifty things. And then sure enough, I came out with this one with a short tube 80 QHY camera. And this is the first image where I actually feel as though I knew what I was, I, I had some notion of what I was trying to do. So I get some Magnus, um, Tycho, um, Clavius is buried down here, but you've got uh, uh, Alphonsus, Arzakel, and the uh, other, one, other one tucked down here. Tranquility, Mare Chrysium, looks reasonable. Excuse me, David. Yeah. Uh, the camera, the QHY camera, is that a color camera? Or a no, it is, a, it is a monochrome camera. Uh, two and two camera, two, two beasts that I've used is a uh, eight inch SCT and the and the C eleven. Uh, I do have to walk when Loki and Luna walk by because their pads are enough where they will actually shake the, shake the telescope, even though it's a concrete reinforced three inch pad. So I have to say, no, go sit down. I'm taking daddy's taking a picture. Need to get started with a clean scope and a full charge battery. I've got a small video on this one that I, the, the, that we can do, and I'm actually about to try to refresh it. Don't hesitate to clean. Newtonian reflectors. I've got this, this one, got one on a Newtonian that I took apart that's on our JSCS uh, YouTube page. This gentleman here takes the SCT apart. Um, this was the um, eight inch that I started with. You can see there's kind of a haze on the corrector plate. I had to pull the corrector plate and clean both sides. This thing is kind of begging. It hasn't been cleaned for a bit. I'm actually going to tear it down to the focusing knob and put it back together and probably turn it into a YouTube in the process. They're not that. They're not that. They're not that hard at all. Once you once you get on the insides of them, once you take some care, they're pretty easy to do. Focusing options. You can do a feather touch focuser. Some people will try a bicycle handle, but anytime, as many of you know, that if you touch that, touch that focusing knob on an SCT, you're shaking the whole column. It's going to wiggle. It's going to dance like semi-set jello. So what I did was I picked up a Crayford 10 to 1 to put on back of both of them. I use an overstretched clothespin, and when I touch the clothespin, it doesn't bother the central axis of the of the telescope very much. So I'll rotate the clothespin two or three times. I say three times down here. If I come to the clothespin in the same position each time, I consider it focused. Also, there's some visual cues that you pick up as you learn more about the lunar topology and geography that you can see. Once those things start coming into play, you get pretty confident that you're focused. However, oh yeah, I forgot to mention, in the dark, you can touch the, uh, the clothespin and sometimes it works and sometimes it goes patoing and goes in, into two pieces. Usually half of it goes in the pool, the other half goes over my shoulder. 
So I said, forget that noise. Got a, picked up a 3D printer from uh, Stepson and said, okay, I'm gonna work up these things that I found on, on, just found on Thingverse and make these. I had to cut this guy so that I could get 360 degree rotation. This solved the problem, I don't need clothespins. Very important, one that you can take liberties in preparation with the 2017 eclipse. There were multiple phone apps out there that you can use to align your scope during the daytime. It's on iOS only, but now I employ the Ioptron Polar Alignment on, the, on my iPad to check the alignment and, and access directions into North Celestial Pole. The reason being is Polaris is right about there. He's a great neighbor and I don't really wanna jump the fence with a chainsaw at this time. So. One time Al Kelly was in here talking and he mentioned using the Celestron Star Sense and I'm one of these guys, if Al Kelly recommends it, I see if it's in the budget and I go get it. This thing has been a godsend for me with a, with a Celestron scope. What it does is it plate solves, figures out where it is and then, lock, and then gets those settings locked in for, that, for the evening. I have very little drift when I do this. Otherwise I have to do some form of drift alignment and that can be kind of a pain. However, a liberty that you can take with lunar imaging, but you can't take with tradition, traditional astrophotography, is I can keep the cursor on a crater rim or a center spur peak and have the hand controller set on its lowest, lowest slew rate and just give it a little nudge. So I can go motor speed, I think on the Celestron, it's motor speed one is slow, and I just punch these. And if I wanted to keep the arrow on the upper end of this, upper end of this crater, that's what you do. And if you get a really bad frame, that's okay. Auto stack, it's gonna kick it out. So it's a liberty that you can take that you can't take with traditional astrophotography. So I'll start off visually, check the moon, set the, ca set the camera, put it in a position, fire up um, uh, fire capture and away we go. Best time to shoot, you remember this from the er earlier part of the talk, ideally when it's transit, when it's as close to the thinnest part of the sky that you possibly can. You don't wanna shoot in either end of the long part of the atmosphere because the image will be wobbly. It can be a little, little bit unstable. Um, you have to consider the atmosphere for that. So one time while waiting for the moon to get into a decent position, I slid the camera over and grabbed, uh, grabbed Saturn and Jupiter. I would love to claim processing for this, but Chris Wells, this is 110% you. He did this with, I gave him the, the, the uh, auto stackered images, he worked the magic in uh, Registax. I still don't know how to work Registax to this day in that, in that regard, but thank you, Chris. Okay, the workflow in processing, I would use fire capture to capture the AVI, auto stacker to stack it. I have been asked by a couple of people in HAS and a few people in NF and FBAC, I need to actually make a YouTube of what I do in auto stacker, and I'm, I plan to do that. I used to go from auto stack out of auto stacker into Registack six because of the wavelets for sharpening, and then from there I would go into a Photoshop Creative Cloud. Creative Cloud is a uh, um, sixteen bit TIFF. I was alerted to the fact that auto stacker can actually do some sharpening, and since then I have removed auto stacker from the workflow. So basically, it's fire capture, auto stacker. I let auto stacker sharpen. I take these images straight to Photo Photoshop Creative Cloud. In in, in uh, Photoshop, I come in as a, uh, a TIFF image grayscale because any image that comes into Photoshop by default is treated as though it's color. So I need to tell it, no, it's in grayscale even though I know I made it grayscale. Couple of filters, noise despeckle, shake reduction is the biggest help right there. You usually see a major image. Crop as needed, I'll go to camera raw, adjust some exposure, contrast, to try to make it look halfway decent lower the whites, raise the blacks, clarity dehaze to get some of the fuzz out of there, increase the size, and then I will burn and dodge things because I will show you things toward the end that artifacts can be introduced as a process of uh, image processing, either in the stacking, the sharpening, or in the initial stages of working with Photoshop. As I said, I had to take a couple of months off and learn Photoshop. Fire capture here with the particular settings. I wanna make sure that I've got Nothing, I don't have any spikes down here where I'm undersaturating, but I don't wanna have anything blowing out of the top. This is a perfect, perfectly good one, about 80% saturation, and we're pretty good to go. Let's see if this will work. Ah. 
What this is supposed to be is I tried to make this a 10 second video of an active uh, uh, capture session. So it was originally 35 seconds, 4,000 frames at about 117 frames a second. Um, the little thing, well, no, no. That bar is supposed to come across the bottom. I apologize. But basically what you're going to... Yeah, I think this is the slide. It was usually showing up here on my on my version at home. Sorry, folks. Um, but what you would hopefully see is you can see some of the rills, center spur peaks, kind of winking out, letting me know that this is is reasonably focused. You are not going to see it drift because of the tracking involved. And it was just a sample of a, a sample of a vid that I wanted to show. Sorry. So I come in and use auto stacker. It pulls in the AVI, grades each, each individual frame, aligns them. The output is a 16-bit TIFF. It is freeware. But it comes up, pulls up your image here. You set your one point here to, to, to say, yeah, this is the center of the image that I want to start. Surface expand. I won't go into the, into the gory details of this. But then you tell it to analyze. And then as you, as you get closer to actually doing the stacking, I'm telling I want it to stack 10%, 20%, sharpen them and save them in folders. 4,000 frames in this particular one. Um, let me go for this one. This is, an, this is an obscene picture, I have to admit. Uh, I say that because here it's already analyzed the data. The, this is the quality graph and I'm getting good quality 50, plus 50% all the way out to 75%. Of, I never get that. I'm lucky to get 30%. Usually that green line's dipping down by about over here. I usually we'll do 15, 20, maybe 25%. Some people doing planetary will stack upwards of 80. <clears throat> I have stacked 80% and actually I see absolutely no difference between 25, 20% and 80. So I usually do 20, 25%. Why make the computer do the work? That much extra work. Auto stacker can also batch. So if I come in after an evening of 17 images, I set it up on the first image. I said, okay, I'll walk you through the first image. It'll do the other 16 while I'm asleep. I wake up the next morning with my cup of coffee. I can mow through and look at the images that, that, that were processed and stacked. All right. Here's a still from the 35 second. This is Brema Hygen. This is actually a really interesting place where this north area and the south area literally pulled apart geologically. And the top there, top area just fell in. It's thought to be a volcanic rill. I cannot find it where I found it, but it was... It was under those pages when you look at all the Apollo missions and they had them out to 20, out to Apollo 20. Apollo 16 was rumored to have ended up visiting, it was rumored to possibly be here. But instead, as we know, it went to uh, the, the Cart Highlands. And Tycho as well, yeah. Yeah. Best 20%. Okay, a little bit of improvement. Auto stack or sharpening. Yeah. Now you can see some of these volcanic rills, some of the volcanic highlands here. You can actually start seeing just a smattering of the detail in the in this in this collapsed region. All of this is uh, lava burping up. It was Walt Kiefer from here at the Lunar Planetary Institute says lava is on the moon is not like what lava is on Earth. It's not thick and gooey. On the moon, lava flowed like milk. So there's none of these big, huge peaks. It just goes burp and spreads out laterally. And that's where a lot of this stuff spread out here. But here you can actually see some of the detail in the center spur peaks, floor fracture craters, things of that nature. There it is after Photoshop. Cleaned up a little bit more. There's some more detail. There's some more extension. Some of the details of some of the, rail, some of the rails. So vid frame, stack, sharpened, final. There's the importance of, 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 of it. Now, I'll be honest, the sharp stack, the sharpened version is not bad. I've done some stuff from the George and just done the sharpen and left, left Photoshop out of it. So, yeah, how important is the processing? Here's first and last. So don't think just because you see this on the screen, oh, my God, I'm getting a lousy image. You've got to let the processing and the, the stacking software do the work for you. Final steps are conducted in Photoshop, Creative Cloud. I pay the $9 a month rather than worrying about having to have it loaded on the computer. Uh, Connie's request was, well, just make sure you use it because how many of us have subscriptions that we don't use? I want to make sure that was one that I actually do use. 
of Theophilus. You can see the little nifty detail in that centers per peak. So I thought I knew Photoshop, found out I didn't. All right, so on to images. Most of the images I'm gonna show you are from the, C from the uh, uh, C11 using the Crayford focuser. So, Mare Tranquility, Sabine Ritter, uh, Hypatia Rills, this is Mulkey. And then I show these to people and they say, you know, can you annotate it a little bit? I said, sure, why not? You got this nifty thing here, cat's paw, that if you dial in on L, on, on L cross, it actually looks like a cat's paw that's in freshly raked cat litter. Um, Aldrin, Collins, and, uh, Aldrin, Collins, and Armstrong. Armstrong, of course, is the biggest. Smallest is actually Collins. If you can resolve Collins in the telescope, in a six or eight inch telescope, your seeing's pretty good because that puppy's only about two miles across. Up on the north side, Serentiatus versus, uh, um, uh, Ser I'm sorry, Serenity versus Tranquility. Up here in the Taurus Littrow area, at the risk of pixelating it out, I kind of pull up this region, pinpoint landing. Demonstrated in Apollo 12, but absolutely here with Apollo 17. They had mountains on three sides and they just came, came over the eastern walls, flipped over and dropped down roughly right about in here. This is a highly ref albedo reflective area. I took those slides out of this talk for the sake of time. There's a paper authored by Harris and Schmidt, uh, published about 10 years ago in a journal called Icarus. Uh, where he talks about the highly reflective nature of this of this area. And I've actually found it difficult to photograph because it's either white or it's black. And if it's white, it's totally saturated out. I need to go back in and try, try to shoot this area again. 15 is the easiest. It's on the uh, Mare Ibrium side. I'll show you that in a bit. But here is the uh, Hadley, Apennine Mountain Range, uh, Hadley Apennine Mountain Range. This is Mount Hadley, 18,000 feet. One of the things we have on the moon that we don't have is depth perception. Archimedes, we got the slide in here. Hadley C is here. The asterisk is roughly where um, uh, Apollo 15 landed. Just to the down to the left of the asterisk, you might see this little dimple above the red dot. That is St. George's Crater. St. George's Crater is 7,900 feet across. So if you can start resolving uh, St. George's Crater, and the rill, the rill that wraps around this mountain. I've got a better picture of it coming up. That rill is only nine tenths of a mile across. So if you can resolve St. George's Crater and some of these and some of the, the rills, you're doing real well. And the seeing is good too. Seeing, if I haven't said so, bad seeing can also be mistaken for bad focus. No, it's not me. This is L Cross. This is Hadley Rill. This is Mount Hadley. There's St. George's Crater. And definitely not, I, though I wish, this one is not mine. But this is an issue of the uh, lack of depth perception. To me, I figure I could just come right up over here and lop a six iron across. Nope, not at 7,900 feet. Depth perception is, is clearly lacking there. Here's a little bit better version. Here's where uh, Apollo 15 landed, Mount Hadley. This was taken probably a few days earlier but given that the shadows are going to the left, I took this on a waning moon, which means I probably got up at three or four in the morning to get this shot. Here's Hadley Rill. This thing is only about nine tenths of a mile across and some 500, 600 feet deep if memory serves. 15 is the easiest one to find. 16 is a little tough. If you can find Theophilus with a full floor fractured crater in the center spur peak, your eyes just wander over here and you come across these two near pristine craters, even though this one's kind of missing the south wall a little bit. They're conjoined here, but they're almost otherwise pristine. They're, they hit early on. They're very old craters because they're lava filled. There's not a lot of, act, you don't see a lot of um, terraced walls, floor fracturing or center spur peaks. But if you can remember, kind of get this locked into your head and you come over and you see these two white dots, Apollo 16 pretty much landed right between them. Apollo 12 and 14, out in the middle of bloody nowhere. 14 is a little easier to find because there, at least there is some geography with some of the craters here in order for you to try to leapfrog and find your approximate place where 14 landed. 12 is out in the middle of no place. 12 actually landed in what they call snowman. This is a, a, a L cross lunar, lunar imaging. This is the head of snowman. This is the main body of snowman. This is the feet here. 
They landed here. Conrad and Bean had it that was facing outward this way. If he just spun it 180 degrees, they might have been able to see Surveyor from the lamp without leaving the lamp. Well, they just plunked it down. The real goal and point for Apollo 12 was to demonstrate being able to do a pinpoint landing because everything else, Hadley Rill, uh, Descartes Highlands, Taurus Littrow, had to be pinpoint landings. And they literally came around, walked over, grabbed a piece, and in December of 27, 20, I'm sorry, December of 2017, that piece was still in the Smithsonian. So there's no, you don't have a lot of geography in order to try to pick out that landing site here. However, hot off the press, some of you may have seen this, India's Chandrayaan-2 has been scouting the moon. It was launched uh, July of 22nd of this year. It arrived in lunar orbit, orbit of, the 8th, of the 19th. It's got a high terrain ma uh, mapping camera and its primary objective is to map the lunar surface. So it's got a high spatial resolution of five meters and a swath of 20 kilometers. And what it does is it takes repeated swaths and it blends those images and you can almost, almost frickin' see the landing pads in some of these. Absolutely amazing. Hopefully put the moon landing deniers, the final shut up nail in the coffin on that. Lindsay, Dolan, Apollo 16, you go take these go, and one, two, three, you're right over here at Apollo 16. These are probably two of the closest landing sites. Everything else was a little bit further away. David, are you sure those weren't uh, photoshopped in? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Disney special, or Lucas T, you know, THX. This one I show because actually what happened, uh, Lady Luna was kind of, Lady Luna does what's called procession. And she kind of sits there and wiggles and wobbles as it goes through, as it goes through her, her cycle. And in this particular part of the cycle, she's more head down. My lunar uh, maps ran out of telling me, telling me what craters are what. I, I had no idea what this stuff was up here. I had to go to the online, uh, online lunar atlases. Same thing from over here. Uh, Marihol Humboldt Titanium is usually a dark streak on the far horizon. But what's happening here is Lady Luna is showing us uh, her left shoulder, if you will. And I usually don't see this. And I grabbed this picture immediately, right, when I took it and I emailed it to, to Sonny Manley. And he fired back, said, congratulations, you got it. Oh, by the way, here is a website to show you in real time how the moon wobbles in its, in its procession. Tycho to the south, um, one of the largest of the new craters, only 65 miles across, but hit some 500 million years ago. Magnus here, Clavius, with its interesting array of, 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 of uh, impacts here. I'll show, show you that one a little bit later. Ptolemus, Alphonsus, Arzakel are actually three craters in full-blown history. This is probably the oldest because it's lava filled. You don't see much in the way of terraced walls, not no fractured fractured floor, and there's no center spur peak to, uh, to to come across. Here, Alphonsus is probably a little younger, but no, I could not find dates on any of the three of these. But this one probably hit when the moon was largely uh, kind of like semi-set jello in a lava sense. Alphonsus, you still have a little, you got a little bit of a, a center spur peak, a little bit of a floor fracturing. You still see some of the the uh, crater wall um, staircase effect. But down here, our Zachel is definitely the newest one of the bunch. Very clear center spur peak, terrace walls, floor fracturing. This is one of the, the highlights of, of, of outreach because there's, there, there's definitely history there. Now, we're talking about craters and in tens of kilometers across, but recall that Meteor Crater is only barely uh, 3,800 feet across. 560 feet deep, Nickel iron meteor was estimated to be about 30 to 50 meters across, impact energy about 10 megatons. Here's Alphonsus, 153 across. It would stretch from Galveston to just short of St. College Station. You imagine the impactor that created that in comparison to what's in Meteor Crater. Aristocars off to the side, very highly reflective. Uh, 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 soil being ejected out of that, as well as Schroeder's Valley. This one is more like a, a, a V, V-shaped walls, flat four, straight across. I have no idea why that why that was that was created that way. It was a very interesting photographic object. 
Let's look at craters in a little bit of detail. Yeah, this is a small digression. If these represent the layers that are in a crater, you have your meteor comes in, and what happens is your soil literally lifts up and flops back. So the bottom layer here ends up now being the top layer around your crater. The intermediate layer, same thing happens there. And what was your top layer is immediately your, your, your a second layer right in there. They found this to be true at Meteor Crater. They came in and said, wait a minute, no, we're exploring the soil here. This is Toro Eap. Why, why is this up here when it should be down here? And then they realized the structure of how this happens when an impact hits. It literally, the soil literally lifts up and flops back. I found Kaibab was wrapped, was wrapped around, as well as the Moen Cope. So then when you look at something like this, which is Copernicus, 56 miles across, 2.3 miles deep, terraced walls, all this out here, for lack of a better grammatical term, is flop back from the impact. And all of this stuff here, all the stuff, all these impacts, dribbles, impact craters over here, all of this stuff up here is all secondary impacts based on the primary impact of this, of this impactor. I can just get lost looking at it in the detail. These two little guys are about one and a half miles across, so I think I was, I was doing okay that night. Meribium, um, some 712 miles across. The actual rim of, of Meribium is below the plane of the screen, comes up, wraps around. The impactor is estimated to be approximately 250, 200, 150 miles across. It was, was kind of hit when it was semi-set, semi-set lava, but it still was had enough force to create the, the uh, mountain ranges around. Uh, sinus iridium clearly obliterated that wall. Plato pretty much kind of uh, did the same thing up here. There's been some stippling and lava flows that have broken through going back and forth. But this is the largest impact. I did actually nab this one from the West Dome. With a focal reducer, I got more of a, a, a wide, wide view of it, Meribrium, Serenity, Chrysium, Tranquility, and Copernicus. And you can just see, again, the flop back of all the ray structure coming off of uh, Copernicus coming back. Schiller, a little bit of an interesting thing here. Um, Daniel Barron, Barringer, who the Barringer family still owns Meteor Crater, by the way, but in his efforts to determine how how uh, craters are formed, found that you could take a rifle, a steam gun, potato gun, whatever you wanted to use, take it down to at least about a 30 degree incident angle and you will still get a fairly semi-circular crater out of it. This to me is an in, in, indication of, a, of probably a glancing blow. If it is, great. If it's not, I don't know. But to me, it, to me, it looks like a, in, a, a kind of a glancing blow. This is the pile up from getting scraped all the way up here. 43 miles across, 109 miles long, 2.3 miles deep. This is on the southwest side. Straight wall, there's our Zachel, we talked about that one. Our, our straight wall is actually a great uh, uh, outreach object. What it is actually is two, two, the floor kind of separated at an angle and so what you're doing is, is, is either in a waning or a waxing moon, particularly if it's a waxing moon, the sun will come in here, catch the lip, and cast the shadow. And that's kind of what you're seeing, seeing down here. This runs a good 80 miles across. It's a cute, cute little thing to catch up with. All right, getting down here, this one and the next one I think are probably right now my Sunday's best. I really like the detail I got out of this, Theophilus with the... Uh, uh, Oh, center spur peak, terraced walls. Again, I can just stare at this forever. <laughs> Rupus Altai, here is Fractosaurus. This is still down on the southeast, the southeast side. Rupus Altai here, this is actually the lip of this particular crater when it was formed. Particular Reno is there. All of this piled in lava, additional, uh, additional things. Now, what particularly caught my eye was this guy right here and I blow it up here at the risk of pixelating it. You've got this string of things going here and counter almost parallel on the opposite side. These are what are called catenas. And there's a catena over on the Arzachiel side as well. Um, I asked a few questions and came back with, no, it's not geology, it's not this. So I, I took these two pictures and I tossed them right here at Walt Kiefer. 
and said, what's the theory? What's going on here? And he said, well, first of all, he complimented me on the images, which made me happy. Um, but he said, that is an ongoing area of, area of active research. Right now, it is thought that these could be a collection of five or six or 10 in some cases or more little tiny asteroids off the tail of a comet that just managed to slide away from said comet, work their way through various gravity wells and go shifting from one to another and then impact the moon. Pretty much the way like Shoemaker-Levy did in a linear line on Jupiter. And he said, we're awaiting confirmation. I said, well, how's that working for you? They have to find the asteroids. Then they got to track them. And then they hopefully got to track them and watch them hit the moon. He said, that's going to be a tough one to prove. But right now, that is the going theory. I said, well, that's good enough for me. All right, rounding out. To do imaging, you will need space. Best option is a dedicated computer. I don't. I have a half-shared computer, but I need to get, a, get one. A 4,000 frame AVI will take 40 to 70 seconds and easily be 4 to 10 gigs. Your evening plan may, may include five to seven or so regions of interest, but you'll soon find yourself wandering and shooting and shooting and shooting. I have filled as much as three to 400 gigs in one evening with anywhere from 16 to 43 AVIs. I'm on my third portable. I'm now turfing marginal data. I only keep the stuff that's really, really good because I, like I like to try to hang on to that. And I may decide to go back and reprocess it. You will make mistakes. And that's part of learning astrophotography. Plan on it. I don't look at fail as fail. I look at fail as first attempts in learning. These two are very clearly improper focus. Focus and seeing will be your main burdens, particularly seeing, particularly if the atmosphere is very humid. Spend some time figuring out what it takes to focus on the screen versus focusing in the eyepiece. As I said, they are completely different. Here's focus seeing, focus, focus or seeing issue. You know, they got some detail here. I could think this is more seeing. This is very clearly an oops in the camera. No histogram, didn't pay attention. Here is a false uh, uh, art processing artifact. This is the great wall, or this is the straight wall. You see right next to it, there's a false wall right next to it. This needs to be jettisoned, restacked, and processed. I will take an image and work it all the way through Photoshop. I'll kind of put it in a folder and leave it there. And if I come back three or four days later and say, okay, I'm pretty happy with it, I'll go ahead and stick it on Facebook or send it out to the, send it out to the clubs. But more often than not, I have come back and looked at an image and go, oh, hell no. Delete and start over with the uh, stacked AVI because I've probably over-processed processed it somewhere. This one down here to the lower right, I tried to work this one up to see if I could show, yeah, you could salvage, a, salvage an image. I got rid of the double streak, but you still almost see this little humpy ripple in there. Nah, forget it. Just forget it. Start over is the easiest thing. Gray shadows. I argue with Bart Robert Reeves that there are no gray shadows. Everything's black. Bathtub rings will occasionally come up. You'll see a ring in somebody's picture that looks like it doesn't belong there. There will be gray or concentric circles with shadow craters. Baggage tags, patches, patches of false detail attached to anything. Parallelism, false ridges, I showed you that. False center peaks, center spur peaks. Craters smaller than about 15 miles do not have center spur peaks. Also depends on the dynamics and uh, impact mechanics, how hard that impact was. Dust donuts created by, by dust on the optics. You gotta kinda get that figured out and keep your optical train clean. I clean with extreme prejudice. If I see, said, oh, I'm gonna image the moon, but I, I get one lick of dust on that, on that corrector plate, I'll clean it. How do you improve? Reach out of your weight class. That's what I was doing, that's what I would do, and still do. I look for people who are doing it better. I uh, hypothesize on what my current problem is, figure a solution, wait for a clear night, and try to get it going. UA Melling in Germany uh, uses a Zeiss Cassegrain on an on a equatorial mount, and he's getting just incredible detail here with Center Spur Peak here, as well as uh, Clavius down here. I'm gonna dial in on Clavius here, because the, the gentleman who's really got it, Lou Cathala in, uh, in, in France, was using a 625 Newtonian that is clock driven using a 4X Barlow. He's got the bar real high for me because he's using the same camera I am. And he's got some really impressive, impressive things here. 
references and links, you're more than welcome to snap a picture of that. But uh, Jeff Lepp, Sonny, Al Kelly, Chris, Trevor, Doug Holland, Robert Reeves, I have to thank for the efforts in all of this. Um, again, feel free to, uh, I can put that uh, Astro bin up on, the, uh, up on the main page. And with that, I thank you for your time. Forty minutes, Doug. I hope. Dave, I remember as a kid, people doing crude photography then, but it was in books too. People were trying to look at the undistorted limb of the moon. And so books and magazines, they would take slides, project them at an angle on a wall and re-photograph them to make like oval craters look circular and bring out more realistic mountains you ever see that do you ever see those they were yeah, they were deliberately books. distorting the photo. i've got one of those older books yeah oh, you okay. can see it that way and then um sonny manley from his house now in hilo he actually used wind jupo and got clavius not as sort of an egg-shaped oval he got wind jupo to kind of correct it and make it more circular there i don't know if it's that's introducing an artifact in a way but it, it looked really good <laughs> And he and I, he and I talk a lot. Uh oh, I'd be more worried if Walt was sitting here. I would too. Uh, so I'm, I'm just curious. And I saw. Sorry if I missed it. If you showed it earlier, have you ever caught any any on the limb of uh, Orientale? No, I can only just barely catch the edge of it. Um, with the procession, I hope would hope to catch more. But I'm going to be honest, it's not something I'm originally looking for. I'm looking for which is what's facing us. But, you know, that, that that's a good thing to try to catch. There's some pretty wicked secondaries coming off of that one, too. You can do this with your 10-inch. <laughs> an 8-inch, actually. I grew oh, okay. one in high school, too, but. Um, anyway, uh, I had a couple questions uh, for you. One, uh, what, this is just out of curiosity, what was the crater that Armstrong had to fly over to when he came down? Anybody know? Anybody know that one? Not off the top. No, uh, that, that part, the tranquility they thought was going to be nice and serene and not, not a lot to fly over. It wasn't until they got down that he realized, oh, we, we've got oh a lot of gosh, rocky yeah, stuff right, and right. stuff to fly over. No, I, I don't recall that particular okay. crater. Uh, that's fine. Um, the other question I had was looking back over your 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 history, your extensive history and taking photography, how do you what all had to happen right to get that picture off the back of your truck in the beginning? I mean absolute dumb luck. I mean I did, did that shot, I that, processed it in Registack and thought, oh, this is gonna be easy. I said no. I don't know. I it just happened to have been set just right. It literally is an untracked dub. The moon just did this. I just snapped my like picture. And past and that was it. That was it. All right, folks. Thank you. David, thank you for that very interesting presentation. Okay, next up we have Hattie and Dow with Sun, Moon, Earth, the NASA Eclipse Ambassador Program. Come on up here, Hattie. Hi, everyone. I'm a bit nervous. This is my first time. So um, I hope you will understand me. And um, okay, so. Um, um, the NASA Eclipse Ambassador Program um, focuses on the um, on outreach for the um, well, Sun, Earth, Moon, uh, basically astral objects around us. And um, so, I am an ambassador, and um, I got partnered with Daniel Royce somewhere in this room, 
and that's um, how I'm here today. Okay, so um, the NASA program with um, the Astronomical Society Pacific. Uh, okay, I can see. Okay, so basically, it it is pairing undergraduate students with a um, uh, an experienced astronomer, and in this case, I am the undergraduate student. And um, so basically you will apply online through the website usually is, it takes about less than 15 minutes, a bunch of questions. And it would probably ask you if you already have a partner or if you want to be assigned a partner in case you don't have one. And um, you will go through 12 hours more or less of um, training is, it is self-paced, and uh, at the same time, you will be having meetings in between with other ambassadors. And so far, they have around um, 115 um, ambassadors, like, grouped together. And um, so Daniel and I are supposed to be putting outreach programs together to um, for underserved communities to teach them more about astronomy um, and um, STEM in general. I, I attended one of their meetings, uh, I think two days ago, and they say it is not just about the moon or earth, or about um, STEM in general, all of science, just to encourage kids to be, to partake in that kind of science, maybe to want to study it in the future, etc. cetera. And um, this is us, um, that's a weird, uh, yeah, it is designed to um, encourage STEM studies and um, also um, ensuring safe public participation in um, astronomical events. For for instance, we have a um, partial solar eclipse coming up this um, October, and um, we will be outreach to teach people about solar solar viewing safety, etc. And make it fun for all ages. But our goal um, would probably be um, younger people, like elementary up to high school. Uh, so yeah. Okay. So um, NASA has provided us with some equipments that they put that they do provide with um, all of the to all of the ambassadors because it is by team. So once they do have a team or a partner, they would send them a. Uh, um, to do like the sun and earth, the moon distances, like um, uh, the um, the presenter was showing us earlier, you could see the uh, with the um, with the rule, and you have like a, you you're supposed to do like the thirty earth distance thing to find, and then do your own eclipses with those mignet like the miniature moons and um, um, suns, etc. So it is really cool. And then teach them also about the moon phases, um, the, the eclipses, why do eclipses happen, how do they happen, etc. And then, um, yeah, so that's about it. What to expect. They do teach you um, how to engage with the public, um, how to ask questions, how to receive questions, how to educate them about it without probably hurting anyone's feelings or beliefs, etc. And um, that is about it. So if any of you guys um, are interested, they are still looking for ambassadors right now, uh, experienced astronomers or just anyone who would be interested, an undergraduate student or any student in college right now that would be uh, willing to partner with someone or if they already have their own partner and then go doing all of that fun stuff. That is about it. Any questions? Yeah. All right, thank you, Hattie. All right, Ron's not here, right? No, Ron. Okay, meeting after the meeting, we get done here. We'll be getting together at Mod Pizza. <clears throat> you just come out here, zoom up Middlebrook North, turn left on Clerk City Boulevard, right in front of the HEB is a Mod Pizza. We'll be getting get together there and talking about astronomy and other things. Okay, um, we got a really full second half. Okay, so we're going to take a short break. We'll take a five-minute break.
and we're going to get back here and get going on the second half of the meeting. See you then.
We're going to get started. Sorry about the short break, but we got stuff to do. Okay, so first up, we have Aaron is going to bring us a What's Up in the Sky. And I'm going to stand here and talk until everybody's, yay, Aaron. Come on, Aaron. Aaron is the club president over at UH Clear Lake. There he is in all his glory. So I'm waiting for our vice president to sit down and pay attention. Okay, thank you very much. Because we're not going to have Aaron up here talking to himself. Where are you going? Okay, now you can come up and talk. All right, thank you. <laughs> ah, yeah. Howdy, folks. Oh, that is me. Uh, yeah, what's up in the sky? Um, I decided to change it because it seemed a little boring last couple times I did it. Uh, I took this West Dome, Georgia Observatory. Um, so this is a picture of the Summer Triangle from Clear Lake. It's real hard to see. It's about a four to six second picture. Uh, this is something easy for new people to look at. If you look in the east, it'll be kind of pretty high just after sunset. We're going to go into Stellarium, and this is what it'll look like in Stellarium. Um, huh? So look, look to the east after twilight. Uh, the summer triangle is actually an asterism. asterism. Uh, it's not a constellation, but it's uh, made up of three separate constellations. Uh, asterism is a pattern of stars um, that is not a constellation. Then, uh, so the most prominent star in each of the three constellations is Vega, Deneb, and Altair. Um, I just learned this doing this the other day, but Vega is the fifth brightest star in both hemispheres. Uh, and it actually sets the zero point for the magnitude scale, which I thought was really cool. So meaning it's zero magnitude. Uh, yeah, yep. So the three constellations that make up the sun, summer triangle are Lyra, which is a harp, uh, Aquila the eagle, and Cygnus, the swan, I don't, or it's not, is it a swan? Yeah, it's a swan. I always get confused and call it a goose. Um, <laughs> is it the summer goose, right? Yeah, there's a little overlay of an artist drawing. And I actually, the whole time, thought the wings were pointing down. This was the tail of the eagle, and the head was over here for two decades now, until I just saw this the other day. Um, so yeah, that's some, something new people can come and look at if you don't have a telescope, it's just to look at an asterism. Um, this is Alberio. It's the head of the goose or swan. And, <laughs> and, uh, yeah, if you have a small telescope, you know, six inches or, um, whatever, this is an optical double star. I've done this in here before, but I'm doing it again because it's actually actually up at a reasonable time. I was looking at it at three in the morning, but now it's at a reasonable time up in the sky. Oh, that's another thing. Alberio, there we go, is actually the bottom of the, the Northern Cross. So an asterism within an asterism. It's like inception with asterisms. Um, this is kind of crummy. This is off Stellarium once you put in um, an eyepiece the type of telescope you're using, and if you're using a Barlow lens or not. This is what Stellarium says it looks like. Uh, I think you can actually separate it in, in a smaller telescope because they're pretty far apart. Uh, this is from an eight inch telescope. It's real easy target. You just lock onto it and you don't have to do much. This is, I think, yeah, it's just with my phone, I think maybe a 10, 10 millimeter eyepiece. It's like 120 zoom. So that's kind of what you can look at. Um, Alberio A is actually a double star in itself. I've never been able to split in an eight inch. I don't know if anybody has or can. Yeah. Uh, and then Alberio B, the, the cool thing is you can see one is blue, one is kind of gold yellow there. That's a fun thing uh, for new people to do. I, I always say uh, you can tell God's a, a 
U of M fan because he puts it in gold and blue. <laughs> so, you yep. the next thing we can look at, this might be a little harder for new people out here. Um, I don't think I've seen it out here. I've seen it at George Observatory um, in the 14 inch, the C14. We did AAE on it a couple weeks ago. But it's uh, between these two constellations here, Sagita, which is the arrow of Sagittarius. And this is a fox pecula planetary nebula, um, which is a star at the end of its life cycle. Um, the mass of one of these had to have been between one and eight solar masses um, in its life. And then it's, it just died and started shedding its outer layers off. This is not exactly what you're going to see out in, in, in our skies. I tried to adjust this for our light pollution, but it still gave me some of these nice picture overlaid in there. Um, but you'll see, see a fuzzy spot in there. It's actually rather large compared to like the ring nebula. This is AAE from George Observatory. I just kind of snapped it off the screen we were doing. Next thing I'd like to talk about is the ring nebula. This is always a fun one. And it's actually a little bit easier um, to get to because the two stars right here um, are a good guide to finding this one. It's a little smaller. This one I have seen um, in my area in an apartment complex uh, with an eight inch look pretty good. This is what it'll look like through an eight inch Dobsonian with a 10 millimeter puzzle. That's, um, 120x right there. This is what it looks like from the George Observatory. Something you can see. Oh, and then another thing, if you don't have a telescope and you want to do astronomy, you can still look to the east, southeast, and you can see Saturn. Uh, it's going to be kind of a bright, non-flickering, yellow star-like object. Uh, 10 p.m. tonight, it'll be 13 degrees above the high horizon. If you wait a little bit more, it'll, it'll eventually get higher. Venus and Mars and all that's kind of dipping away, so I didn't do that one this month. If you have an eight inch telescope, this is kind of what Saturn will look like at 120X. Another thing is Jupiter. Jupiter's coming up. If you, if you go to bed really early before the sun sets, you get up early, Jupiter will be in the southeast. It'll be really bright. It'll be the brightest thing in the sky besides the moon at that time. Bright white star-like object. And then the last thing you can do to observe something astronomic, astronomically this month is the full moon. This will be on the 30th date here, <laughs> but this is actually the 30th. Oh, Doug, you didn't change it. That's all right. Uh, it'll be a blue moon. What's a blue moon? Oh, yeah, two moons, two moons in one month. Uh, the moon actually takes 29 and a half days to go through a cycle. So that means some months, every two to three years, they get a blue moon. What's it going to look like? <laughs> oh, <No. laughs> that Someone used a blue filter for that. So this is more like what a moon's going to look like. Cheese. Yeah, blue cheese. <laughs> Questions? I do have a question. So all the pictures you showed in there, were those all ones you took with your telescope and your cell phone? You know, like Saturn and Albireo yeah, and all those. Yeah. Those are all ones you took. Ex except I didn't use my telescope on the Ring Nebula. That was, we were doing AAE at the George with the C14. I but took the, the first, you showed two Ring Nebulas. What about the first one? Were they both? No, that's through Stellarium. Once you zoom, so in Oh, that was, Stel the first one was Stellarium. Yeah, Stellarium, okay. you can put in your telescope data, uh, focal length, all that. Your I, I got it. In it. All right. I was just trying to figure out if you did that with your scope and your... No, I'm no. not that great yet. Okay. Yeah, were any thanks. of the other ones yours? All of them were mine, except except this one. That's Yeah, thank you. Okay, thanks.
I just have a quick question about the uh, the Ring Nebula one. What uh, I'm assuming you use software for it because I found it for the first time like two weeks ago at my telescope and it was all gray. So uh, I'm assuming you did stacking and Photoshop and color modification. Yeah. Sharpcap. Okay. Yeah, the. Okay. All right. Yeah, because I, I found it, and when I saw that, I'm like, what am I doing wrong? All right. <laughs> what What does AAE stand for, David? EAA? Yeah. There you go. Yeah. You're welcome. Okay, thank you, Aaron. He's picked up our What's Up in the Sky segment, so I really appreciate him doing that. I, I am going to say one thing about the Ring Nebula, though, since this gentleman brought it up. The Ring Nebula actually is really bright. In fact, we were out at the Freeman Library in the parking lot with the lights on, and we were able to see the Ring Nebula in my three-inch refractor. It, it is bright. I mean, it's got, it's got a high surface brightness, so you can see it in almost anything. So if you want to go out and look at a, you know, a deep sky object, it's really easy. Ring Nebula is it. You agree with that, Jim? Absolutely. It, it is. Put a filter on it, O3 filter. Yeah, it's pretty bright. So, anyway. What? It, yeah, it is facing us. You know, it looks like a Cheerio in the sky, uh, but it's got real high surface brightness. So, it's, it's easy to see. I mean, we were out there. Everybody's laughing at me. I said, I'm going to go for the Ring Nebula, you know, out here in the middle of you know, the parking lot with these lights on, and we could see it, you know, and no one thought we could do it. But. And that's a three three inch scope too, little tiny thing. What? You got a question about your own presentation? <laughs> okay. So, is a three inch lens, or you know, on the front of a refractor, comparable to three inch mirror? Is that the same thing? Is it equal? Roughly, yeah. How does that? Re refractors overall in general do just slightly better for the same aperture size, but roughly, yeah. So it, it's actually an 80 millimeter, which is close enough. I think David and I would both disagree with that. Okay, the principle fine. of a... Uh, Let's see, now it all comes out. Okay, all right. So I got uh, uh, DIY astronomy in two members minutes. I'm going to zoom through real quick. Okay, so okay, so you guys, you know, we're always looking for new places to go and do astronomy, you know, dark sky areas. So I was going to be zooming by this place called Copper Break State Park in July, and uh, I stopped by to look at it. The reason is because Copper Break State Park is designated an international dark sky park, and there's not all that many of them in the world. Uh, this, is a, this is a big deal. So International Dark Sky Park, it is here in Texas. It's Bortle 2, so it's, it's Bortle 2. Okay, Fort McCavitt and X-Bar Ranch are both Bortle 2, so it's you know similar darkness to those two. And these guys, the IDA has designated these, you know, International Dark Sky Park. And so they're real proud of it. They put on their sign, and they're, they're really very interested in supporting astronomers here. I went and visited with them. They just love talking to me. This is what it looks like on the light pollution map. The cross there is where it's located. This is actually, I think this is Dallas. Wait a minute. That's Amarillo. I don't know what that is. Some, oh, it's, that's actually Oklahoma City. Okay, so right there you can get an idea about where, how it is dark, uh, you know, light pollution-wise from the light pollution map. Okay, where is it? Here we are, Houston. There's Dallas. There's Wichita Falls. Here's Amarillo. It's in between Wichita Falls and Amarillo. So how far is it? It's, it's, it's farther away than Fort McCavitt and X-Bar Ranch two other places we normally go, but it's not as far away as Texas Star Party and it's not as far away as Okie Tech Star Party. So it's in between there. Okay, this is what the place looked like. That's me taking pictures for you guys. These are these campsites they have. And basically what they are, they got these little weird looking structures here that gives you some shade, which is a good thing. And they got a picnic table, each one. And these all have power and uh, water at each campsite. <clears throat> and, and here's the other thing. It's got very low 
level, very low height vegetation. Because, you know, a lot of times you go to state parks and for whatever reason you go to state parks and for what, you know, some reason people put trees in state parks, which I had no idea why anyone had a tree in a state park. But the thing is, this park is perfect for astronomy because the trees are very low and you can shoot, you know, much lower to the horizon than a park that has a whole bunch of trees on. This is what the restrooms and the showers look like, which I think you guys will agree with me is an upgrade from most star parties we go to, which are porta potties and other things like that. So a little bit better. Um, they actually really do cater to the astronomers. They've actually built some telescope pads out here uh, for their public programs that they do. There's no power or anything there, so that really wouldn't be of interest to us, but they have this field out here and this is where they do their programs. Okay, there's during the day there's hiking trails you can go to and zoom around there. This is from their web page. They, they push stargazing, have monthly programs. Okay, so on the campsites, you can have eight people at each campsite, two vehicles. Uh, there's 24 of these campsites, picnic table, restroom, water hookup, power, grill. That's $20 a night or $120 a week plus a $3 daily fee. So a little cheaper than most star parties we go to. But I wanted to pass that along to you guys because it's another possibility for us. Okay, next, I got a member's minute. Um, UH Clear Lake Star Party in May. We went out to UH Clear Lake and we got a star party. If you stopped by my telescopes, I was looking at double stars. I've been trying to do this presentation for several months, but we never had time to do it. So I'm going to try to do it tonight. All right, so first of all, let's just say a couple words about the HR diagram. Um, the HR diagram, because it's, it's going to be relevant to these stars we look at, is a uh, diagram that, that shows temperature versus absolute magnitude versus luminosity over here. And along the top, there's the scale OBAF, OBAFGKM, which for our purposes here, what we want to see is that this goes from blue to red. And you go to A to M. And I know there's extensions for this, but for our purposes here, we're just interested in those. So HR diagram. And these pictures I'm going to show you, are these double stars. So we went out. And, you know, at, this, at these star parties, a lot of times I show double stars. And I talk, talk to people about them and ask them what colors they can see. And I thought a couple days after the star party at UH Clear Lake, I thought, you know what, I'm going to go out and take some pictures of those with my telescope. Very similar to what Aaron did. He took a picture of Alberio, you know, with his uh, daub and, and a uh, cell phone camera. And my point of this is that these are actually pretty easy to take pictures of. I, I took them with, take these pictures I'm going to show you with an 8-inch Richie Cretion. But, you know, I use ISO 100, which is pretty, you know, low ISO number. And these integration times, it's like 0.4 to 1.5 seconds for all the pictures I'm going to show you. doesn't require any calibration frames, doesn't require anything. It's just one single shot. And this is one thing you can do in astrophotography that's really easy. I mean, you can just go out there and, you know, get your double star in there and take a picture of it with a color camera. And they're super easy to, to do. So here's some of the, the stars that we looked at when we were at um, UH Clear Lake. And so I wanted to show these to you guys. Um, the first one is 24 Coma Berenices. And these all are scaled the same on every one of these. So the first one is 20 arc seconds uh, separation. But what I want to draw your attention to is if you look at these spectral classes, like this first one, the, the brightest one is a K0, which is on the right side of the HR diagram and in the, the second and the dimmer one is an, an A9. So actually within the OBA, K, whatever, there's also numbers from zero to nine that, that uh, split them up, you know, 10 for each letter. But when you look at these, I mean, you can see, I mean, you probably would all agree that that looks kind of bluish, right? And this one looks more whitish. Everybody agree with that? Or more reddish? So they really are. You can actually look at this. And this is one of the this is one of the few things you can look at with your eyes, with your telescope, and actually see color in it. You know, most of the things, you can't see color in nebula unless you've got a really big scope, but, uh, or galaxies or anything like this. But you go out and look at double stars, you can see the color in these things. The next one is Zybootis. <laughs> this one's separation is six arc seconds, so it's closer. Uh, magnitude 4.8 and magnitude 7. This is a G8 and a K4. And you can see the... Uh, brighter one, more white, and then the K4 is more um, reddish. Zeta Lyra, separation 44 arc seconds, a lot farther apart. A magnitude 4.3 and 5.6. Got a B7 and a, a A8. So these are both on the blue side of, this, of the uh, scale. Those both look pretty blue, right? And this one here, 95 Hercules, separation 6 arc seconds. 
It's got a magnitude 4.9, 5.2, and it's an A5 and a G8. So the A5 is the bluish one, and the G8 is going to be the one that's less blue. It's more reddish or white. Last one, Alpha Hercules, separation 0.5 or separation five arc seconds. So it's getting down to the point where you can hardly resolve it, at least with this setup in that evening. So it's a magnitude 3.1 and magnitude 5.4, and it's an M8 and a G8, M5 and a G8. I also put the light years down here. But anyway, the point of this is two things. If you want to do astrophotography, this is really easy to do. Take pictures of double stars. And I want to show these to you because you really can see these colors in these things and see these different, you know, see that there are different spectral classes associated with these different stars. So that's the point. Okay, last one. Uh, the skies over Buena Vista, Colorado. I was zooming along. I, we did an astronomy tour of the New Mexico and Texas and Colorado and Oklahoma. And uh, so I was able to, I took a telescope and some other things with me, but unfortunately my astro camera died on me. And so I could not use my telescope like I wanted to, but I did have along with me a camera lens, a DSLR, modified DSLR. So I did take a couple pictures I thought I would share with you tonight. Okay, whoops, oh, and so there's my, uh, there's my mountain sitting out. Here's the mountains out here. This is 8,000 feet in Buena Vista. And Bortle 4 sky is not super dark, but uh, dark enough, darker than we have here. But it's kind of nice. Well, you guys were all here in 105 degree weather. I was out there in the mountains having fun. And this is what it looked like from our cabin. I hate to show you one, one vacation picture, but I'm going to do it. Okay, so here's our cabin, and here's this patio, and here's the, this is the Arkansas River flowing right next to so This place was just absolutely beautiful. And we looked out and found a good uh, VRBO that was really nice. Okay, anyway, so back to astronomy. This is. Anybody know what that is? Crescent Nebula, NGC. That's right, NGC 6888. So I've taken this picture many times with a telescope, and you just get a you know, field of view that's about like that. But with a wide-angle lens, like a 200-millimeter camera lens, you can see the Crescent Nebula here, and you can also see down here. Anybody know what that is? What? No, that's no, this is in Cygnus. I got any idea. I, Trevor, you know what that is. You've taken this same yeah, picture. Uh, this, this is the close. This is the, this is the Seder Nebula. This, this is Seder. Uh, it's all, it's, it's IC, yeah, it's IC 1318, which is also it's called the Seder Nebula. It's also called Gamma Cygnus Nebula. But this is just one side of it, which is probably why Trevor didn't recognize it. But the cool thing about this is when you take a, a wide-angle lens and take pictures of this, this gives you a real, you know, idea of what does our galaxy really look like. You know, you go out here and you take this thing, and there it is. Sometimes when we zoom way in, you really can't see it. But when you zoom out and you see this wide angle, this is really what our galaxy looks like. I mean, we've got these gigantic nebula. We've got these small ones like this. That's actually not – that's a um, wolf ray star, actually, is what that is. But it's a nebula, but it's a wolf ray star. Okay, and then the, the – Last one, second one, and last one. This is the um, this is LDN 1235. This is the Dark Shark Nebula, and this is in Cepheus. So yeah, this is this is a cool picture. Um, anyway, I've been getting in, getting interested in taking dark nebula pictures because I, I find them interesting. But if you're trying to see the shark, that's his eye, that's his mouth. This is his fin. That's his lower fin. This is his tail up here. But but in general, again, when you take these wide angle shots like this, you know, this gives you an idea. This is really what our galaxy looks like. I mean, it's, it's you know, sometimes when we zoom in on these little things, we see this little bitty thing here, but you, you take a wide shot of it and you can really see how things are, are where they're positioned, where they're, how they're related to each other. So that's the point. All right, that's it. That's my web page if you want to look at pictures. Thank you. Next up. Next up, we have our Vice President, Chris Wells, who's going to tell us about the FISE United Space School slash JSCAS event. Chris. Get the applause beforehand. That's pretty cool. Oh. Actually, Doug, a presentation makes me think I need to travel more and 
<laughs> and get out there. <laughs> I I know, I know, and I love the wide field shots. And uh, yeah, no, that's great. And your uh, the pictures you had of the double star started making me think how much fun it is to not only look at double stars through a telescope, but also to evaluate the optics of your telescope too. Yeah, particularly if you've got um, a refractor type telescope or you're trying to collimate your smith cassegrain telescope, double stars are just an awesome way to look at your equipment and just see how far you can and how much you can get out of the instrument you have. And you look for the tightest double stars and see if you can split them and see if you can see dark between them. That is so much fun. I really get, like to do that. And you can do that in the brightest skies as well meaning in your own backyard here using double stars is an awful lot of fun so i'm glad you took the pictures because that's that's just a that's fun. that's and a lot of fun right oh. okay okay i wanted to talk uh, very briefly and i told doug that i'll do this really really quickly um uh, if you remember in the in the meeting last meeting we talked about the united space school are in town uh, for, 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 uh, what is it, Dan? Two or three weeks? I think it's two or three weeks, right? Four weeks, a whole four, a whole four weeks, 42 kids from 20 countries. I hope I got that right. 20 countries. There you go. And, um, and what we decided to do is every year, um, when that happens, they always have a star party event and it tends to be at Dan's place who's sitting at the front there. Uh, but this year we decided what we wanted to do is do a little bit more and uh, try and get some presentations and more outreach in, in, in involved. And you know that's what our club's main primary objective is, is to actually do more outreach, uh, not only to the international uh, kids who are part of the school, but also to the, to the uh, community that's supporting them, this whole community in this whole area. So um, we actually set up um, not only a bunch of uh, JSCAS presentations, um, at the South Shore Country Club, but we did that ahead of the star party that was going to take place at Dan's event. So this is qu a quick flyby about that event that took place on Saturday, July the 22nd. Okay, the first thing... Did I get that right? Okay. First thing is, it was really well attended. Uh, the first presenter, or the opening presenter, um, um, is there on the left. You see a, a bunch of tables with a bunch of kids around there. Um, just look how well attended it was. We kind of figured that there'd be around about 120 or so people there. Well, we, 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 we went over that. We had to get more tables in and more chairs in. There were that many people there, about 130 in total. So not only did, uh, and this is, this, is, this is really thanks to Dan who organized for, for the space school, the event for the not only the kids but also the families that supported them they all came other colleagues and friends came uh the club members came and other people as well came so it's a fantastic event tons of logistics involved dan you pulled it off look at all these people here having a great time it was a really loud event <laughs> yep uh, fa fantastic event. This is this is uh, this was it at the end. Um, you see a number of people. You might recognize a few places there. Okay, so um, it, as part of this, we organized an agenda. We had door prizes. Well, where did we get the idea of door prizes from? This club here. So we did the same type of idea about door prizes. So the winning ticket here. Somebody getting the winning ticket, and uh, I had each of the, each of the kids kids read out the numbers so you got they got a sense of all the different accents from the different countries and not just the british guy talking so that was that was fun to do that um we had a lot of interaction there then with the with the kids for the door prizes okay this is the slide to say thank you to the JSCAS presenters. Um, we uh, we started it off obviously with uh, well with Congressman Lampson who did some opening re remarks. Um, uh, uh, Jerry here in the audience that his great presentation on the Vera Rubin lessons from the galactic rotation observations. Kayla did a great one on the on the Messiers. As I say, we had the door prizes. Brandon was there too, giving his um, excellent presentation on cosmic inventory. And uh, we also uh, placed a call to the Houston Museum of Natural Science. And the adjunct professor uh, th there, um, James Wooten, came to give a presentation on how to observe the total solar eclipse. 
And then we ended with uh, with an astronaut, Mike Baker, who 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 gave some closing uh, closing statements and some some pictures as well from the space station. So he's a vet veteran um, astronaut. He's gone up on uh, four space shuttles to the space station. So lots of lots of great presentations there in um, just over two hours. It was a really jam packed event. Okay, so here's another picture. Um, oh. Is a picture of uh, Je Jerry in action there, a picture of Kayla in, in action, giving the presentation. Here's the uh, the speaker's table. And, uh, and as James Wooten is just in, in right in the, on the left of the uh, round, round table there. So once again, thank you to the, uh, all, all the presenters to that, to that event. I mean, a massively attended event. It was just a buzz, absolute buzz. There's Kayla in action there. Um, Actually showing, I think, M13, Hercules uh, globular cluster. Once again, do take a look at the globular cluster. Get your telescopes out. Fantastically placed right now. I was at the Insperity Observatory a week ago today for the public night, and I got to look at it through a six-inch Takahashi refractor. Absolutely fantastic. Got spoiled. Loved it. So just a little plug there. Get your scopes out. Look at M13. It's perfectly placed. Okay. And then... Uh, there's uh, an, another, there's, uh, uh, James Wooten did a fantastic presentation. Um, he was very interactive. He interacted with the, uh, the audience about eclipses, and he had a model uh, of the Earth, and he had a model of the, of the moon, and he asked one of the members of the audience to say, how far away is it from there? And, uh, and, the, and the girl in the middle of the picture there was taking it as far to the, the other side of the wall because you don't realize how far away the moon really is, for, is from the Earth. So you've got a real perspective there, a lot of interaction with the, uh, with, with, with the kids on that presentation. It was followed by a star party uh, in the same neighborhood at, at, at Dan's place. I uh, hope you don't mind, Dan. I uh, cribbed your picture there. Uh, I know it's, uh, and I think you've got some observing in, right, on the telescopes? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we really both. But the kids enjoyed the swimming pool. <laughs> <laughs> it's from the operator, so you're talking. Yeah. 20 countries talking. Yeah. Yeah. If the whole world could be like that. Yeah, the energy was absolutely fantastic. Uh, uh, um, actually, don't don't underestimate the Star Party event. It was a lot. Of, it was actually a fun thing because a lot of some JSCAS members were there. I was there, and the actual weather changed. It changed and the clouds came in and there was, I know you, you're not going to believe this, there was outside air conditioning, right? <laughs> we could, it, all of a sudden, every, the, te the temperature dropped, everything got cool, and then everybody jumped and got, grabbed hold of the telescopes and safed them, I think, in the garage because we were starting to get some rain showers. But when you get that moment, they do exist. I know it's hard to believe but because we're going through the heat right now, but that outside AC uh, event where we all cooled down was a lot of fun. Anyway, fantastic event. Thank you to JSCS, everybody who participated. That's Thank it. you, sir. All right, Chris. Yeah, Chris, thanks for uh, pulling that off. I was glad that I was gone so you could do all that by yourself. All right, next up, David with Star Party News. All right, a lot of things on the calendar, brand new. Um, yeah, this transpired and I have nothing to say because Chris did it all. So <laughs> August 26th, uh, we'll have event at the Hack Winery. September 8th through 16th, we've got Okitex. September 22nd, we've got a new event on the calendar, stargazing at El 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 uh, Evelyn Meadow Library. I'm all talked out from before. We got a first quarter moon coming in there, um, October 19th through 14th. I'm sorry, 9th through the 14th is El Dorado. Uh, I put the website up here if you want to get on that. It is also coinciding with the club's trip to the Fort McCabe. I'm not sure how that's going to work out, but you can be actually do the annual eclipse at both. I've got slides on that coming down the line because both of them are in the path of totality. Pomona and Manville residential area is under discussion for um, early September. 
that's going to be a stretch. I'm going to actually see if I can pull some strings on F back because that is actually just west of 288 uh, off of 59. So it's going to be, it'll be a little bit of a stretch for people here. October 21st, International Observe the Moon Night at the George. This is sort of A Day, but slightly, slightly rebranding A Day. Also, October 21st, UH Clear Lake Physics and Astronomy Club. Uh, Aaron included me on this one a couple of days ago. International Observe the Moon Night, um, 6.30 to 10.30 at the STEM building. On November 7th, apparently Dr. Masood has got a star party going. She said out by the dumpsters again. Sorry, Aaron, that was literally out of your email note. I'm assuming it's going to be roughly the same place. Yep. Okay. And November 7th. Okay. So I should put tentative? Yeah. Okay. Okay. I'm going to put that on the website then. November 8th, Bayside Intermediate, CCISD. They asked about this one initially. This one was at Singa Sent to Fort Bend. They've lateraled it back to me. Time to be determined. Uh, hopefully we can find double stars, Doug, and things like that, because there will be no moon that night. We've got to work out the details on where geographically it's going to be at the school. November 18th is going to pretty much wrap up the uh, year for be our, our final final event at the uh, Hack, Hack Winery. Just where is Fort McCavitt? Doug kind of did this with the other one, so I'm going to do it here. Houston, San Antonio, come down here past Junction, about 365 miles, depending on how many stops you make. San Antonio, Kerrville, Junction. Then you come over here to Farm Road 1674 and work your way up to the fort as you see here. A lot of this is in the primer that is on the front page, that is on that is on the web page particularly. Make the turn in. In here, this is where all the camping and the RVs and the such will be back here. You need to get in contact with Ken and Lisa Lester if you want to go to this. Remain parade grounds, bag and barracks, ruins. I think the RVs now are back here, aren't they, Doug? I'm used to the days when we used to camp inside the ruins. That was a good windbreak. But here's 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 get the the meat of it. On this particular trip, Fort Fort and the the, the trip to the um, X Bar Ranch also includes the annular. This is your center line. Here's your outside lines here. San Antonio, going to dial in a little bit more. Here's your center line. There's your outside line. Junction, Roosevelt, Fort McCavitt is going to be inside. Fort McCavitt's again up here. Fort McCavitt, um, UT to local is five hours, so 1521 off this chart. Local is going to be 1021 when the C1 is going to start. Uh, just for the reference, if you need to ever figure out converting universal to local with or without daylight savings, you've got the website website right there. El Dorado, going to be tucked over here. Fort McCavitt, here's your center line. So if you want to go really by the book, the, your X-Bar Ranch is going to be closer to the center line than Fort McCavitt, but both will be there. Come down Highway 10 to, to what is that, Sonora, and then work your way up. El Dorado, got it over here. Uh, this is the map I stole off, shamelessly stole off their website, it's how to get there. And then if you're gonna stay local here at the George, 1027 local C1, and that's pretty much it. It's not gonna be a total, it'll be a complete grazing. I don't know what they call it when it actually leaves, it's probably not C4, but you never know. Um, Zuby, you're free. Uh, site here will always let you know where your eclipses are on on, on, uh, on Google Maps. It's pretty cool for that. All right. Why there alien? Is one, there is one, but you may not be aware. What you got? But, uh, on the very first. That's your party. Okay. September. All right, that's all, folks. Okay, thank you for that, David. Um, Dan, you were just trying to tell us something, but we didn't get it to our. No one gave you a microphone. Can you repeat? Oh, the people online can't hear you unless you talk. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, I was reminding David that I forgot September 2nd, a day that we live in infamy. <laughs> we have a usual monthly store party. It's always the first Saturday of the month. 
So if it interferes with anything, it's not my fault. Uh, the very first Saturday of every month, Lake City Park Services organizes a star party at uh, uh, Rustic Oak Park, okay, which is pretty hard to find, but I have a map for it. September 2nd. All right, and one other thing, Al, do you want to talk about your telescope for two minutes? If you can make it really quick, we got like five minutes. Come on up here and just talk to us for a couple minutes. Al brought a telescope if you wanted to show us. We got 10 minutes, so I think we're doing good. Oh, you want to take this with you? Here, Al, you can do that. Yeah, he brought a telescope and he asked me if he could talk about it tonight. And I told him we didn't have enough time, but we actually have 10 minutes, so maybe we can do it. Hello. Uh, some of you all might have seen my talk online about my 12 and a half inch telescope I built. And this isn't the final telescope, but I just wanted to show it. Uh, this is a common, uh, easy to get uh, refractor lens from Surplus Shed. And this is their short one. So this is five inches and it's only 700 millimeters and they're harder to get. They make several different versions that are like 1200 millimeters, which is about four feet, so considerably longer. But I was told that I should mock it up with a focuser and everything before I finalize making a real tube assembly because you don't want to make it too short or too long. So I've got a fuel flattener to work here. Since this is so short, a fuel flattener is almost uh, mandatory. So that was kind of important because I had to cut it down another inch and a half. But I just brought in to show like that you can make these things. This is $250, five inch, you know, maybe store bought is closer to a thousand, maybe $700 or something. I happened to have the focuser, so that made it a lot easier. And this was uh, just some tubing from Home Depot. So, you know, you could use it this way, but, you know, just thought I would let you uh, see how it works. Yeah. So actually, and he told him you got it from Surplus Shed, right? Yeah. Yeah. And Jerry, where's Jerry? Jerry's working on one from Surplus Shed too. You got a Surplus Shed uh, objective, and I've got one too that that I've put together. So it's it's really great. If you guys don't know about Surplus Shed, get on the web page. They got a lot of cool things, uh, good and bad quality, but be careful. Okay. <laughs> Anyway, um, okay, door prizes. Look at your door prize ticket. And what your number is. Okay, first one, 543025. Buddy? Okay, too bad. Last year, 543005. All right, come on down here. Now, since David gave us talk about the moon, we have moon maps. I have a Starliner mouse pad. Oh, I have a ZWO keychain, coveted keychain. Hey, don't laugh, it's cool. <laughs> and then the book Gravity, see, look, it's a classic. It's been almost worn out. And a music CD, The Meltdown. Oh, there's another book, Our Solar System. I was holding out on a good one. All right, thanks. Thank you. All right. That's Jonna. In case you don't know her, that's Jonna. Okay. 542-995. Oh, come on down here. All right. Okay, moon map, music CD, <laughs> mouse pad, a book about gravity and a ZWO keychain. <laughs> you want me to see if there's anything better in there? <laughs> no, come on. Um, the mouse pad. Okay, mouse pad. Very good. All right. Very good. All right. One more. One more. Okay. Five, four, three, zero, zero, zero. Somebody who got her pretty early. Five, four, three, zero, zero, zero. Is it David? You want your own moon map? 
gravity. But meltdown. Meltdown. What the meltdown? ZWO keychain. Do you already have one of these? No. Okay, you got it. All right. ZWO makes cameras. Look at that. Isn't that beautiful? I think there's actually another one of those in this in this uh, in this box somewhere. What? <gasps> okay, great. Okay, ZWO is doing scopes, according to Trevor. Okay, next month, our upcoming meeting, September 8th at UHCL. It's going to be an introduction to astrophotography for photographers. A fellow named Rich Wellborn is going to be our speaker. And uh, did somebody raise their hand back there? Okay, all right. So that's it. Uh, thank you very much for coming. See you all at Mod Pizza directly after the meeting. And look at that. We are ahead of schedule. Woohoo! Yes, our thanks to the LPI. Yep.